Right, Premier League game week 12 was absolutely nutty. Lads, I have gotten into a recent habit of placing my neck on the line for every week in my predictions video on the Friday. I am promising a mega forfeit if I do not get at least one scoreline 100% bang on. I mean, my forfeit on Friday was that I would have to do this entire video with five bags of ice in my clothes. Yeah, I would be colder than Judy Dench sitting in a fridge. So, uh, let's just see if I get any right. Right, let's go. Ask for the three full of one. Play the clip! Aston Villa 3 full on 1. Aston Villa absolute dynamite this season. A comfortable 3 1 win. Yes! Yes! The streak continues. I've been doing these weekly Premier League predictions since game week 6. I've gotten at least one correct scoreline every single week. I mean, for game week 6, it was Liverpool beating West Ham 3 1. For game week 7, again, okay, I didn't really get any right. But for game week 8, I said Crystal Palace and Nottingham Forest would draw 0 0. For game week 9, I said Tottenham would be full on 2 0. For game week 10, I called Arsenal beating Sheffield United five 0 and Brighton a full on playing out of one one draw. And for game week eleven, I was right about Newcastle beating Arsenal one 0 And now for game week twelve, my correct scoreline is Aston Villa three full on one. Every week, I am raising the stakes with a mega four fit. I have to get one scoreline correct, or something horrible is going to happen to me. But because of this match, get in. No ice in my clothes. And yeah, Villa turned it on once again. And Anthony Robertson on goal, a John against strike. And yet another Ollie Watkins goal. But uh, Raul Jimenez bagging his first Premier League goal for 18 months with a tap in that he could not miss. Thank you, Raul. If you had not scored, and lads, he's barely looked like scoring for two years. If he hadn't, then yeah, right now, I would be shivering like a hypothermic bear cub. Imagine it will be for Raul Jimenez to score a goal. And if he doesn't, you'll have the skin of a snowman. But no, because he scored, no ice. Thank you, Raul. Honestly, lad, with these genius predictions, get me on football tenable. I promise you, if I was on that show, I would put everyone else to shame. Oh, by the way, if you're here, trying to get to 180,000 subscribers, we are an inch away. If we can do that today, you'd all be the biggest legends on the planet ever since the dinosaurs. So go on, hit that subscribe button. Let's squeak over the line to 180. You absolute legends. Chelsea 4, Man City 4. Wow, wow, wow. That was absolutely nuts. Let's play the clip. Chelsea Nilman City 4. I'm sorry, Chelsea fans, but I reckon they're in for an absolutely humiliating afternoon. I promise you, this will be City's biggest ever win at Stafford Bridge. Trust me, Pochettino is going to be like a depressed spider by full time. Uh, I said that Manchester City would score four at Stafford Bridge. I got that right. I just didn't bag on Chelsea scoring four. Lads, that was an incredible Chelsea display. I knew that Mauricio Pochettino would massively improve this team. Because yes, for the first two months, the drab, stale, sour results. Look like the same pudding results they are picking up at a Graham Potter a year ago. But no, lads, Pochettino is, and always has been, on a different stratosphere to that wet noodle of a coach. And here, they were utterly electric. Raheem Sterling ran his old employer's ragged, and even celebrated scoring against his old team. Fair play! The fact Thiago Silva is still scoring bullet headers in monster fixtures in the Premier League at age 39 is surreal beyond belief. The thing John Terry, the biggest legend centre back in Chelsea's history, he was washed up and burnt out at what, 35? And yet Silva is still the best defender? What does he eat? Just cauliflower protein shakes and tea leaves for lunch? I mean, at his Brazilian barbecues, what's his secret? Is he just char grilling the bones of a rare dinosaur? What gives him this weird superpower? But as Chelsea could have crumbled towards the end of this match with the scores locked at 3 3, the ball falls to an unmarked Malo Gusto in the city penalty area. He's unmarked, it's on his left foot and he spoons it over the bar. That would have won Chelsea the match for Rodri to then belt in a lucky deflected winner in the 86th minute. I wouldn't have blamed the Chelsea players for collapsing with exhaustion and devastation, but to rally, to come back, for Amanda Broya to force a penalty and for Cole Palmer to show the nerve to dispatch his third penalty for Chelsea against the club he spent his whole life with. Lads, it only feels like five minutes ago. This bloke was dreaming of following in the footsteps of Foden. He was even scoring a wonder goal for City in this season's Community Shield. So now scoring a last minute penalty against them to slightly disrupt their title bait. That was not on the cards for Palmer's career in pre-season. For him to become the Man City enemy before he's 22. It's just wild. But lads, this match reminds me of that Champions League classic between Guardiola and Pochettino when Tottenham knocked Man City out of the Champions League despite losing 4-3. With Ryan Sterling running Spurs ragged in that match. Honestly, this was just the same. Ozzy, Pochettino and Guardiola need to get together more because when they face each other, it is always a classic. I don't think there are two other managers better suited to coaching against each other. These two have unbelievable chemistry. Because honestly, when they set their teams up to face each other, 
It's always an unbelievable match. Man United won Luton Town nil. Yeah, I said that Luton would sneak a win at Old Trafford. I was incredibly wrong. To be fair, I was right about Man United only managed to score just one goal. But okay, well done, Eric Ten Hag. You managed to grind out a win. But was this not the worst, the most unconvincing way to win a match? This is like Tyson Fury's win over Francis Ngannou. Sure, technically it was a victory, but it was a little embarrassing that he's forced to spend the last minute of the fight sweating over what the result was gonna be. Once the subs were chucked onto the pitch, Man United had over 400 million pounds worth of talent struggling to break down workman like little Luton. Honestly, Andros Townsend was literally auditioning for a job in punditry five minutes ago. He just admitted to Ben Foster that he likes to gorge himself on chicken feet for lunch. Sure, that does make him sound like an insanely creepy bloke. The Ted Bundy of poultry. And once the word gets out, I would not be surprised to see local cinemas banning him from attending the sequel to Chicken Run. But there is no way the Manchester United should have been frightened of seeing this man in attack. What's also delightfully bizarre is that he now goes by the name Townsend C Senior on the back of his shirt. For those wondering, Andros has a son, Andros Jr., which explains the senior on his shirt. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't at all. Famous sportsmen fathers constantly talk about not wanting to push their kids into following in their footsteps. Conor McGregor even said that about his own children. And he's normally got the morals of an Eva Santa Claus. I'm pretty sure there was once a Rocky speech in a film about not wanting his son to be in a shadow. But Townsend. He's barely giving his offspring a chance. He's already paving the career path for his kid to be a footballer by literally changing the name on his shirt. Andros is gonna look really foolish in a few years if he spends the rest of his career preempting fate with this weird publicity stunt when his son eventually grows up to just go and work in a bank. Oh, he's gonna be more disappointed in his son's career than Fraser Crane. Ah, uh, um, has anyone seen the Fraser reboot? Yeah, it's about as funny as watching a monkey scratch its crotch at the zoo. But well, listen, this was my guy's eighth win of the season by just a one goal margin. People might want to draw lazy comparisons to Josie Mourinho when he arrived at Chelsea. I know he did 17 wins in his debut season by just one goal, but it was a bit different, wasn't it? They were controlled solid 1-0 wins. When they were in complete control of the match, the result never looked in doubt, but with Ten Hag, it's like he's bumbling his way to these wins. Like Wolves getting denied a last minute stonewall penalty at Old Trafford. What about four? 2-0 behind to Nottingham Forest after just 4 minutes. Scott McTominay only scored 2 in injury time versus Brentford. Bruno Fernandes thinking a last minute winner at Craven Cottage. Having to rely on Henrik Larsson's son missing a last minute penalty at Old Trafford. These are not like the Chelsea 2004 1-0 wins. No, these victories are just falling with style. Forget about Heisenberg. Ten Hag is buzzed like you. Bournemouth 2, Newcastle nil. Poor Newcastle fans. Here they were travelling to Bournemouth, making a horrible 20 hour return trip on a sweaty, soggy mega bus. Literally travelling the entire length of the nation. Can you imagine being stuck on a bus for 10 and a half hours in each direction? Sitting beside some 23 stone bloke who stores cheese sandwiches in his armpits. Someone who thinks it's appropriate to order a delivery of pizza to the bus. Someone who decides to wee in a Pepsi can and do a poo in his lunch box. I would imagine it was a grim, awful trip. And so to see their Champions League hopefuls getting bullied by Bournemouth. Imagine those fans huddled together in that rainy stadium, being reminded that they won't get back to Newcastle to see their wives until 7 a.m. That they're in for another torturous 10 hours of listening to Paddy Sixpenny snorting in their face. No wonder one of them wound up in an argument with Kieran Trippier. It was less about Trippier's performance, I'd say, than it was probably that desperate fan just dreading the return trip home. It was like if there were no eagles in Lord of the Rings and Frodo and Sam had to walk all the way back to the Shire. I think one of them would have just given up and drowned themselves in a lake. Lads, the mental thing about this match is that in the second half especially, this could have been a 5-0 home win. I told you Andoni Iriolo would absolutely blitz the Premier League. I told you he was putting together a neat little former team. Lads, this is the start of their journey into European football. Mark my words. I told you he was a brilliant tactical innovator and was going to eventually spellbind the Premier League. See? But yeah, to be fair, Newcastle had a bench that looked about as inspiring as a scarecrow made of fudge. The likes of Paul Dummett, Matt Ritchie, Emil Kraft. Sure, three players who are about as relevant to a Champions League team as I am to the sidemen. I mean, pretty sure the likes of KSI would just look at me as if I was some homeless leper who steals purses from two-star nursing homes. But at least those players have some experience. But look further down the bench. You have players with numbers 49, 54, and 63 on their back. I mean, number 54 isn't Jacob Murphy, by the way. No, it's Alex Murphy, a 19-year-old centre-back whose career consists of just over 30 games for Galway. Amadou Diallo is an English winger who was chucked on that bench. No, not the main out of whiz kid who tore it up for Sunderland on loan. No, this is some anonymous West Ham Academy graduate who nobody knows about. To put it in context, he is a professional footballer sitting on the bench in a Premier League match and still has less Instagram followers than me? How can that happen?
happen? Newcastle lined up with a 17-year-old Luis Miley in the middle of the pitch, replacing a Real Madrid linked and Brazilian international superstar like Bruno with some child who was born in May 2006. I remember watching X-Men in the cinema that month. This is someone who probably brought his homework to the match. Somebody who won't have a clue what a Ronaldinho was. Oh, wow. And then in the second half of the match, he was replaced by Ben Parkinson. Hands up. Anyone know who he is? Mm. Anyone at all? Nah, he's a teenage striker with no Wikipedia page. It's mental. Richie played over an hour of that match against his former club. And let's be real, he's got the legs of a crippled donkey. Newcastle have 12 injuries right now and suspensions up to their eyeballs. They need the January transfer window and they need it now. Arsenal 3, Burnley 1. Play the clip. Arsenal 4, Burnley 0. All I see is the Gunners finally flattening Burnley. This is a match where Arteta is finally going to stomp all over the Clarets like a drunken Hagrid walking on a bunch of mice. 4 nil. 4 nil. 4 nil. Yeah, I got it wrong. Although, to be fair, I didn't predict there being four goals in the match. I just didn't count on Josh Brownhill scuffing in an ugly strike. This actually reminds me of April 2006, one month before Miley was born. I remember playing Match Magazine Fantasy Football as a child. I had gambled by sticking three Arsenal defenders into my team and praying for a simple easy clean sheet at home to West Brom and then Nigel Kwashi bangs in a 70 second minute goal for the baggies in a 3-1 defeat and I remember it felt like somebody had slapped me in the stomach with a brick now I know how Paul Merson must have felt every weekend when checking Teddy text but it's a good solid win for Arsenal goals from Leandro Chassard William Saliba and an outrageous scissor kick from Alexander Sinchenko the guy who showed the athleticism of an Olympian figure skater what amazes me though is that that was only his second ever Premier League goal? This is a 26 year old superstar who only has two goals in English football. That was only his second goal in club football since 2016. In any competition, I don't understand. When I heard that stat a match of the day, it took a minute to process it. As if someone had just told me they'd seen Al Pacino living in a dumpster in Grimsby, eating a dead dog for lunch. It was just such a bizarre thing to hear. How does Zinchenko, somebody who clearly has the technique of a mini Burkamp, how does he not score more goals when he's got such sizzling ability in his locker? I'm genuinely confused. I mean, did Guardiola beat all the goals out of him by repeatedly telling him to pass? Honestly, at the risk of sounding like Bill Cosby on a pushy date in a nightclub, honestly, take more shots. Liverpool 3, Brentford 0. Play the clip. Liverpool 0, Brentford 0. I think it's going to be an absolutely dogged defensive display. Trust me, I am so confident, okay, that if Brentford do lose this match, I will chuck a bowl of bashed banana in my face, but I just know Liverpool aren't winning this one. <sighs> oh. Why? Why did I say this? This was the perfect example of me trying to be too clever. I thought that I was going to look like an absolute freakish genius when Brentford left this ground with a clean sheet. Fine! That would have been enough, but did I really have to tempt face by threatening to throw mashed banana in my eye? I'm going to stink of a monkey's belly button for weeks. But it's, lads, 3-0. Mo Salah is incredible. The fact he's at 21 years old and has had major dips where he looked like he was going to be past his best any time now, but still roars back to prove everyone wrong. He's what Alexis Sanchez could not do. He has been proving everyone wrong his entire life. Even when he was at Chelsea, his own teammates thought he was just an average pudding cake winger who wasn't cut out for English football. Ozzy, Chelsea only officially sold this man to Roma in 2016 when he was just about to turn 24. Do you know... Do you know what an incredible ready-made replacement he'd have been for Eden Hazard? People like to blame Mourinho for Sada's failure at Stamford Bridge. But lads, he wasn't the one that sold him. That happened on Antonio Conte's watch. How stupid a decision was that? Everybody thought he was about as talented as Andrei Shurla or Maka Marine. This was some scruffy Egyptian kid who used to look at William with awe in training. You know that chunky pudding is now at Fulham? Imagine if Chelsea had just kept hold of this man. But no, you sold him for 14 and a half million pounds. Less than half of what you paid for Michi Batshuayi that summer. Someone Anyone at Chelsea should have done something in their power to stop this move. Because he's now just two goals shy of 200 for Liverpool. 200. Wolves 2, Tottenham 1. Oh, Tottenham. Oh, Tottenham. Oh, Tottenham. Lads, when I was a child, seeing a team score two goals in injury time to turn a defeat into a win, that was fairy tale stuff. Yeah, Man United doing it at a Champions League final against Bayern Munich. It was Roy of the Rovers' dream myth scenario stuff. But nowadays, it seems to be happening every month. The magic is sort of gone because... We saw Man United do exactly that against Brentford last month. It's also happened in two different Spurs games this season. They were the ones to rescue an injury time win against Sheffield United. And now they're on the receiving end of that against Wolves. What is going on? But listen, I did an entire video picking up Ange Postacoglu yesterday. But I think Spurs fans have been brought back down to earth because without the creative magical spark of James Madison, they really do just look like plodding Conte Ball. And midfield three of Ives Basuma, Papi Sar and Pierre-Emile Hoiberg. Sure, they'll be tackles galore, but they've got less creativity than a jar of your granddad's vomit. Could pass 
Lukaku not have just started Giovanni Lo Celso and given him Madison's free roll, license to roam and make things tick? It's weird. Has a team chasing Champions League football ever been so reliant on a player who just been relegated the previous season? I don't think so, but honestly, Spurs without Madison. It's like seeing a diabetic without medicine. It's like seeing the beast off the chase without a pie in his hand. It doesn't look right. And when Spurs are chucking forgotten boy Brian Gill under the pitch, some misfit winger had already been banished back to Spain on two different loan spells. I'm surprised he's still there. But listen, Pablo Sarabia changed this match. An insane equalizing volley, then teeing up Mario Lamina for the winner. And yes, I know everybody is screaming the same thing. Give Gary O'Neill some more credit. He's a way better manager than you think. I'm gonna get his face tattooed on my thigh. Lads, this same Wolves team lost to Sheffield United, one of the worst ever Premier League teams last week. So, relax. At the minute, I am still in the camp of thinking that he is an average championship level boss. It looks like he failed an audition for the live theatre production of Ice Age. Chris Palace 2, Everton 3. No more milk! Let's be real. Everton are safe. 14 points, 14 in the league, and they are on an incredible upwards trajectory under Sean Dyche. It is finally clicking. They are not dropping back into the relegation zone. There is more chance of me growing an evil twin out of my neck than there is for the toughies to go down now. Brighton 1, Sheffield United 1. Play the clip. Brighton 2, Sheffield United 1. I'm still gonna go with a scrappy 2 on Brighton win. Yeah, Cameron Archer will give Sheffield United the lead. But now, Simon Odinger will back two late goals to save the day. Well, I did say that Simon Odinger would score two. He didn't. Just one, but, I mean, his goal was so good. It probably deserved to. Lads, Adingra is the next Brighton superstar. A 21-year-old winger from the Ivory Coast. I can already tell you from the limited minutes I've seen of this guy. I can already tell you he is far more talented than Solomon Kalou. Who went on to achieve nearly 100 caps and is treated as an Ivorian king. Adingra is only 21. He paid his dues playing football in the shivering Danish mountains. Oh, Irish guy, there's no mountains in Denmark. Don't you know Danish geography? No, look at me. I'm pretty sure if you did an autopsy of my head, you'd find that my brain looks like a squash pizza. But yeah, Edinger is going to be great, and as for Sheffield United, it didn't really matter that you picked up a point. You're still going down. I mean, the last time you went down, you stopped a horrible rot by winning at Old Trafford. Yeah, you still went on to lose every week, with largely the same group of players you have now. There are no false dawns for the Blades. There are no glimmerings of hope. You're still going down. 100%. West Ham 3, Nottingham Forest 2. Yeah, pretty mental match. You're back and forth. Crazy five goal thriller. I said it'd be a routine 2-0 win with Jared Bowen scoring twice. No, he got one. As in Lucas Paqueta and Thomas Suchek with goals from Taiwo Awani and Anthony Alanga for Forest. And while it looked like a pretty quality, entertaining match. Anyway, that's it for watching. Let me know what you think. I have avoided the ice. Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give a like. Because as always, I'll talk shit in a while.